Well, the adoption of the Maastricht principles on extraterritorial obligations of states in the area of economic, social and cultural rights is a very interesting experience showing how international human rights law can be made to evolve thanks to the mobilization of non-governmental organizations and academic experts. Um, basically, the idea of these principles being developed emerged from a finding that increasingly human rights were impacted by uh, states other than the territorially competent state um, for, the, uh, for the individuals concerned. Um, the result of trade liberalization, the result of um, investment uh, liberalization and, and economic globalization generally, but also the result of uh, the fact that more and more states adopt unilateral measures that may have an impact on human rights outside the national territory. For example, in cases of transboundary pollution or where states emit um, large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, accelerating climate change, resulting in human rights impacts outside their borders. And so there was a, there was a realization that human rights could not be actually um, realized, could not be fulfilled without addressing also this extraterritorial dimension of human rights obligations of states, particularly in the face of economic globalization for economic and social rights. Um, and so some individuals took the initiative of proposing that um, experts work on clarifying the duties of states in this regard, and, and particularly um, instrumental in this regard was Rolf Kuhnemann, who was the, the founder of uh, Food First um, um, International Action Network, uh, FIAN, an NGO specialized on the right to food, and who uh, took the initiative of uh, uh, gathering organizations and experts to work on these principles um, in 2009-2011. Um, so the principles were, were developed um, uh, and it was really um, the hope that they would gradually clarify the duties of states to take into account the impacts um, on human rights outside their borders um, of the decisions they made at home and that they integrated human rights considerations in negotiating trade investment agreements, um, for example. And there was some confusion here because on the one hand, whilst you have, uh, for example, Articles 55 and 56 of the United Nations Charter that refer to a duty to cooperate for the fulfillment of human rights and fundamental freedoms without discrimination, many human rights treaties actually refer to a condition of jurisdiction um, that led some human rights courts or bodies to limit the scope of extraterritorial obligations um, uh, linked to the human rights commitments of states. And so the, the subject matter was, was confused, uh, the case law was um, moving in, in very different and sometimes contradictory directions. So it was necessary, necessary to, to restate international human rights law, to provide human rights courts and, and human rights treaty bodies with a, a sort of summary of where international human rights law was evolving towards in order to guide um, future jurisprudence in this in this area. Um, and this is what was done by by some experts who worked uh, to draft these principles and the principles were then broadly discussed, um, revised, uh, modified, improved and finally endorsed at a meeting that was held at Maastricht University uh, at the end of September 2011. On 28th September 2011 they were adopted formally by a wide range of human rights organizations and academic experts, including some independent experts appointed, uh, appointed by the Human Rights Council. Um, what's most interesting in my view in the, in the um, Maastricht principles on extraterritorial obligations of states in the area of economic and social rights is that um, these principles try to surmount what is sometimes a, a very um, frustrating obstacle to the fulfillment of economic, social, and cultural rights, which is what some might call the paradox of many hands. When one particular situation is the result of the combined action of a wide number of actors, wide number of states, no state feels responsible to change the situation. And all states um, um, behave as though they had no role in modifying a state of things that delays the full realization of, of human rights. Um, 
So the international environment is not shaped in accordance with the need to promote fulfilled human rights and no state feels that it has any particular responsibility to take action to change this. Um, so the Maastricht principles try to provide an answer to this. Uh, for example, principle 29 um, says, and I would like to quote it, uh, that there is an obligation to create an international enabling environment and this obligation is defined as such. States must take deliberate, concrete and targeted steps separately and jointly to international cooperation to create an international enabling environment conducive to the universal fulfillment of economic, social and cultural rights, including in matters related to bilateral and multilateral trade, investment, taxation, finance, environmental protection and development cooperation. Principle 30 of the Maastricht Principles relates to the coordination and allocation of responsibilities. And it says, states should coordinate with each other, including in the allocation of responsibilities, in order to cooperate effectively in the universal fulfillment of economic, social and cultural rights. The lack of such coordination does not exonerate a state from giving effect to its separate extraterritorial obligations. So the idea is that um, states may not um, remain passive, um, they must take action to promote fulfilled human rights also outside their national borders and they must work towards um, building cooperative mechanisms uh, so that um, gradually states shall um, cooperate further for the, for the fulfilment of human rights and the reshaping of the international economic order um, for it to be conducive of domestic efforts to realize human rights. Um, so I think the master principles are a very interesting illustration of how um, international human rights evolve um, from the bottom up. These are human rights organizations, these are um, human rights um, academic experts uh, who um, have tried to restate international human rights law and, and move it forward. And I think um, these principles respond to real need in times of economic globalization when the separate action of each state may be insufficient for real um, change to be um, to, to take place um, uh, for the sake of the complete fulfillment of human rights.